shift the conversation to the next stage of life, and that is when children begin to enter school. And I know from our past conversations together that you're keenly interested in how to improve the well-being of children by providing them with an education that not only educates their mind, but educates their heart in an integrated whole child. Uh, we have two very exciting panelists with us today, uh, Mary Gordon, who you've met before, and Roger Weisberg. And we're going to begin with a short film on their work. Early on, I was motivated to do this work in social and emotional learning because my experiences in the classroom had shown me how important the earliest relationships in life are, how important the family is and the relationship particularly of the mother and the father with the child in terms of that child's attachment and attunement and capacity to uh, be socially competent. The two main influences in children's lives, the socializing influences, are the institution of the family and schools. And this program that I'm working with focuses on bringing the family into the classroom. Roots of Empathy is a program where we bring a neighborhood infant and parent into the classroom to visit over the whole school year with a particular class. We roll out a green blanket and watch that baby develop over the course of a whole school year. And as the children understand the emotional needs of the baby, they reflect and understand their own emotions and then bridge to empathy to understand how the other children feel. So what we end up with is raising the floor of compassion in the classroom, and we hope changing the world child by child. In thinking about um, the children that we have the gift of raising, sometimes parents forget that being in the moment is so valuable because the child is always in the moment. And noticing your child, the things they're doing and saying, rather than feeling that we have to be instructing them all the time, if we listen to them rather than preaching to them, it's a wonderful way for both of us to learn. The landscape of childhood is changing dramatically, but the child is unaltered. We have in events like the Seeds of Compassion the opportunity to create a song sheet where every child can sing in harmony, where we've brought together our scientists, our best thinking, our best stories, our biggest hearts, to try and create a world that is more kind and caring and compassionate. And I do believe that we all have that song in us. For the past 30 years, I've studied one overarching question. How do schools and families and communities work together to promote positive behavior in children? We knew that SEL, or social and emotional learning, would benefit students' behaviors when we saw that there is also a strong connection to promoting positive academic achievement. It became clear to us that this is something very important that schools need to focus on uh, to promote positive growth and development in kids across the social and emotional and also academic areas. There are five core sets of skills in social and emotional learning, and these skills are universal. Uh, Self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. Uh, in our experience in doing work with all kinds of populations uh, in the United States and internationally, there is agreement that teaching these skills are important for all children. At the same time, the context in which these skills are taught has to be a context that honors and respects uh, the families, the communities, and the countries where these students, our children, live. It's not just enough to do things in the classroom. The entire culture of a school will change with this kind of work. That involves uh, how all the adults in the school communicate with students and communicate with each other and communicate with parents. So the importance of relationship and encouraging people to be their best is something that would be in emphasized throughout every aspect of the education in the school. The long-term impacts of social and emotional learning uh, when children learn uh, these skills and to work well with others and to interact effectively with others, 
uh, will result in the long run in making them better parents, more effective in the workplace, uh, better contributing citizens to their communities as well. So the benefits uh, for society as well as for the individuals are very important. Uh, there are three very clear messages that I'd like to give to all uh, parents. The first thing is it is important for you to be involved in your child's education. The second message is the best way to be involved is to develop a constructive relationship with your child's teacher. The third thing is that it is important for schools to promote social, emotional, and academic learning in children, and it is important for parents to emphasize that they want to see a uh, good, sound education that is going to increase children's academic performance, but also improve their social and emotional skills in relating to others. Combining good science, good practice, and good policy on behalf of students is going to make a broad difference in the lives of many children. So now I'd like to reintroduce Mary to you, who you've met and we shared a stage with you in Vancouver a few years ago. Mary is an internationally recognized educator and parenting expert, and she's the founder and, uh, and president of the Roots of Empathy, uh, a Toronto-based nonprofit that works with programs uh, with children all around the world. Uh, Mary is well known for her work also in developing parenting centers, and she's the recipient of many awards, including the Order of Canada, which recognizes outstanding achievement and dedication to the lives of Canadians. So Mary, if you could uh, tell us a little bit about what motivates your work and, uh, and what makes us sing for you. Yes, thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Your Holiness, for sharing with us. Um, the story that I would like to share with you is a lesson I learned from a boy in a, a very impoverished school region. And this was a boy who was wounded in life. His mother was murdered in front of his eyes when he was four years old. And this boy went through many, many foster home situations. So he didn't have any long-standing loving relationship with a family. And when he was 14 years old, which was two years older than the other children in his class because he failed in school because he kept moving with the foster home situation. So he had roots of empathy in his class. And um, the one day, the mother and the baby were talking, well, the mother was talking about how her little baby didn't like to be cuddled and that she wanted a cuddly baby but she had to accept the baby she got because you don't always get the baby you ordered. So the mother said to the students in the class who were 12 years old, would anybody like to try on the baby snuggly, what you carry the baby in? And she had explained to the children that her baby wouldn't cuddle up in the snuggly, her baby would face out to the world. And this young boy, whose mother had been murdered, who was trying so hard to protect himself from more pain by being tough and pretending he didn't care about anything. This boy said, I want to try on the snuggly. And he was given the baby to put in the snuggly. And that wise little baby snuggled in chest to chest with this boy. And then the boy went off and he was rocking with the baby as he had seen the mother do. And he came back after a few minutes to give the baby to the mom and he lifted the baby out so gently. And he said to the Roots of Empathy instructor, do you think that if nobody ever loved you that you could still be a good father? So we can't give up hope. We have to, I think, appreciate that empathy and compassion can develop from any time, from any age, and that it's not just a village it takes to raise a child. It sometimes takes a child to raise a village. In the world, we are collectively concerned about nuclear disarmament and la clearing landmines, but in our emotional lives, we have landmines in our hearts 
that need to be cleared. And we don't pay as much attention to that. And you have written about disarming the heart. Could you please speak to us about how we can all disarm our hearts? I think this morning I mentioned the right view. That means uh, full of knowledge about the reality. Then, like external matters, uh, internal, emotional world, there are many things. Some are very helpful, some are uh, very harmful, some are neutral. Uh, and all these emotions are, I mean, how to say they, always changing. Uh, changing means it depends on causes and conditions. So therefore, there is possibility to, to change, to transform. to transform our emotion. Uh, so through awareness, through knowledge, right? through understanding, mm, through understanding uh, try to these harmful emotions, such as hatred, anger, or the anger's all of that. Hatred. I think hatred. Anger, there could be positive anger also there, constructive anger also possible. But in any way, you see, these destructive emotions, uh, once realized and understand, can reduce through uh, increasing of counterforce. That's the way usually I describe the inner disarmament. Not through prayer, not through just so-called meditation, close eyes, and uh, uh, just a complete relax, not that way, <laughs> but more analytical meditation, analyze. Hmm. I feel so that is the way. And then once intellectual level, yeah. once you understand it clear, then familiarize so someone, I think this morning or I think this session, you see someone, you see told, because of that, already yeah. expressed, you see the, the familiarization, get used, then gradually some change. So that I usually call in a disarmament. In a disarmament, not through agreement or no. pact. <laughs> in a disarmament is <laughs> through understanding, yeah, yeah, understanding, through wisdom, yeah. isn't it? The mind and the heart. 